Hello, everybody, and welcome to this fourth class of the Economy of Francesco School. I'm Dalila De Rosa. I'm a member of the Economy of Francesco community um, from the village on life and lifestyle. I'm currently working as a um, research officer at the Ministry of Economic and Finance in the field of inequality and poverty measurement. The topic of today is measurement of poverty, well-being, and welfare. And um, today with us, we have a Professor Sabine Alkair from the Oxford University, the Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative. Thank you, Professor Alkair, for being here. And we have also three discussants from uh, the youngest member of the economy of Francesco. We have Diane from the Happiness Village, uh, Kathleen from the CO2 Inequalities Village, and also Christian from the Energy and Poverty Village. So welcome everybody. And before going into the, um, into the topic of today, I just give you two practical info. Uh, the first is uh, that you can register as usual, your attendance, you can register. So in the YouTube chat and also in the Zoom chat, you can find the link, just click on the link and register yourself. And then at, um, in the same chat, in the Zoom chat and the YouTube chat, um, you can write down your questions because at the end of the, of the class, we will collect some of your questions to, uh, for the discussions. So I, you can just type your question there. And well, let's go back <clears throat> to the topic of today. We are going to talk about multidimensional poverty, multidimensional well-being and welfare. I have just a few minutes to introduce the topic and I want to share with you uh, three, um, three concepts. The first one is uh, what is the object of uh, under measurement? What is the object um, that we want to measure? Well, we say the multidimensional well-being, multidimensional poverty, uh, where the word multidimensional is in the sense of going beyond a purely monetary evaluation of human life. The idea is to look at multiple dimensions and um, identify those uh, uh, dimensions which make a life worthwhile. Um, the idea is to think about who are the most vulnerable, the most poor, not just those who lack money, but maybe also those who lack other things like health services or housing or, or wherever you want to put within the borders of multidimensional poverty. And this brings me to the second point. It's not just a matter of what are we measuring, but also how do we measure poverty? When we look at multidimensional uh, phenomenon um, and we put under the scrutiny multidimensional phenomenon, many technical and methodological challenges arise, um, which is the best normative framework for multidimensional poverty or well-being. Is the measure solid, robust, reliable? These are all questions that need to be solved in order to answer um, and um, analyze uh, a multidimensional concept. And this brings me to the third point I want to share with you. Why do we need to measure multidimensional poverty and why do we need to solve all these questions? Well, uh, the, um, according to me, the most important things uh, uh, because we need to uh, measure multidimensional poverty is not just to deliver a sophisticated statistical exercise, but rather is to deliver a, um, a reliable toolbox to policymakers in order to help politicians and policymakers to uh, address the right uh, target of, of people, of individuals with the right policies is in the spirit of economy of Francesco and Pope Francis to uh, address poor individual in order to 
leave no one behind and to include as more people as possible. So the idea is to question which is the most, the most sweet, sweet toolbox to uh, assess such, uh, such reality and such problems. So the topic is uh, tough and uh, is also very rich, but we are uh, lucky because we have one of the most uh, important experts uh, in the field of multidimensional poverty, Professor Sabine Alkair from the o Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiatives. So uh, I give the floor to Professor Sabine Alkair, and then we will have the discussion. Thank you, Professor Alkair. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, um, Delilah, for that fantastic introduction. And thank you to all of you for being here and giving your time and your interest. I'm very much looking forward to our conversation and to our exchange and to the possibility that something new will come out from, from this time together. Um, it's very much in the spirit of the economy of Francesco to try to give a new soul to the global economy, but also trying to figure out how to give a new soul to work on poverty and on well-being. It's, it's a question we must keep coming back to with a fresh start, because this is a time of change. It's a time when the methodologies and the data that we have now, we've never had in the past. And so the possibility to do something new at a very practical level with data is, is open. So I'd like to talk first today about poverty and then insofar as time permits a little bit about the measurement of well-being. But I'd like to start with um, some reflections um, as you can see from uh, Pope Francis's initial talk to the economy of Francesco because Francis, go and repair my house, which you can see is in ruins, is such a, a phrase which can be understood by so many different angles. But what I really captured and held on to from that address was the reminder that the poor and the excluded are real people. And instead of viewing them from a merely technical or functional standpoint, it's time to let them become protagonists in their own lives and in the fabric of society as a whole. Let us not think for them, but with them. And I think this is particularly important if we come to think about poverty. And I'll give you some reasons why. But I also think it's particularly important given the name of this school, the Economy of Francesco, because there's also something free and liberating about voluntary poverty. And there's often a profundity and a different kind of wisdom among poor people and communities. You can't romanticize. There's also um, many, many other problems and each person has their own path. But there are beautiful things as well as very painful things about external circumstances. And so always keeping the soul of the person as our focus and integral human development, it means we get these material conditions in the right balance as very important conditions for well-being, and yet ultimately is not the most important of all. So what the first point I'd like you to recognize is that for you, talking about multidimensional poverty or well-being might be normal, but even recently it was not so. With the Sustainable Development Goals, with Laudato Si, with many recent documents, there has been sort of a mainstreaming of the insight that human lives, as Amartya said, Sen wrote, are battered and diminished in many and various ways. So the Sustainable Development Goals recognizes that eradicating poverty in all forms and dimensions is the greatest global challenge. And this includes extreme monetary poverty, but it also includes other dimensions of poverty. And that's new, that perhaps wasn't there 20, 30 years ago, um, when poverty was really conceptualized primarily in monetary forms. Um, and so within the Sustainable Development Goals, there are explicit targets and indicators 
that focus on poverty in multiple dimensions. And I think this is relevant because then we're looking in a holistic integral perspective at the different deprivations that are striking people at the same time. And we're trying to measure it and build policy off of that evidence. So just first a few words on the outlook, um, which is shared across many different sources from Catholic social teachings to Amartya Sen's approach to Ubuntu liberation theologies um, and voices of the poor. But the first observation is if we want to work on poverty, we need to understand who are the experts on poverty. And these are the protagonists, the men, women, and children who live in these conditions and can speak with authority about what they are and what they are not. Um, and so when you work on measurement, it can be a technical exercise. I'm a trained economist. Others of you have other skills, quantitative. So we can think that we know what's right, what's best, where the data uh, support our model. But actually, we also need to cross-check. So in El Salvador, for example, there was a study called Poverty from the Perspective of the Protagonists, where it evoked from the communities their articulation of the deprivations that diminished their lives and used these articulations to try to build up from the bottom up the indicators of poverty that would be used in a national measure so that it reflected the overall experiences. For example, that poverty measure unusually included violence um, because it is at that point a very uh, precarious situation. And so listening to the experts of poverty is the first place that we start in any, any work on measurement and returning again and again to them is another. And this has been done in many different stages. Um, the Voices of the Poor study is one you might be familiar with um, and many national studies have done similar work of, of listening. The final point on this section, which I'd like you really to remember, is that it matters. Often one thinks and feels that people with power, people with policy actions, um, that they can do what nobody else can to take poor people out of poverty. But what these teachings about sol subsidiarity and what empirical participatory studies show us is that it's not quite that way. So this is a study done by the World Bank um, of people in India who had moved out of poverty. And um, they were asked what was the most important um, driver of their change of status. And they thought it would be the government or it might be a faith-based group or it might be an NGO. And what they found was that the most important of all was actually um, the initiative of the poor men and women and children, that 77% of them are argued that their own initiative was the most important cause of leaving poverty, pulling together different help and supports that other programs offered, but also finding the strength within themselves, their internal motor and turning that on to get up and get out. And so um, this emphasis on listening to the experts of poverty, on understanding the conditions that inflame their minds and so that our measures reflect those, but then recognizing that even with the best of effort and with the best of success and our work can be successful, and yet it is the action, it's the, um, the practical reason of the poor people in communities that ultimately will lead them on a journey out of these difficult conditions. And so we need to see them as people brimming with potential for action and not as passive victims of cunning development programs. And that might be easy if you are doing participatory work in the villages, but if you are sitting behind a computer running statistics, it's something that you need to very consciously continually refresh through the years. So that's our starting point. And yet 
recognizing that and recognizing the limited support our efforts can give, it is still important, perhaps, to measure poverty. So a couple um, things about that. There are different ways and levels of measurement, but one is a measure that can compare across different countries and different contexts, like the dollar 90 a day measure. And that, for example, is the global multidimensional poverty index that we release with UNDP um, each year. We update it each year with, with new data sets. And it's useful because countries can compare themselves with their neighbors, see who's doing better and learn from success. Complementing this, just like every country has their own national monetary measure, which is slightly different than a dollar ninety a day, so too countries have national MPIs with their own data sets, with their own definitions of poverty. Um, some will have employment, some will have, if you live near a river that floods, some will have um, a high level of education, like completing 12 or 13 years, and some will have completing five or six. So it's these really tune a multidimensional measure to what's the priority for the country for that moment. I'll be giving examples from the global MPI, but we work most of our time in our research center with national MPIs and over 60 countries have reported such measures in the sustainable development goal global database. All of what I'm presenting is online and for the geeks, our stata do files are online. For the policy people, every country has a country briefing as a PDF you can download. Um, if you like maps or interactive things, we have an interactive data bank where you can create the figures you need for your own analysis and presentation. Um, so this is a measure that we developed with UNDP um, in 2010 and update annually. And it covers only three dimensions because that is what the data at the present moment permit us to cover for over 100 developing countries. So health, education, and living standards. And there are 10 indicators, um, like if anybody in your household is undernourished, or if sadly a child died in the last five years, if nobody in the household has completed six years of schooling, or if a child is not attending school through class eight, or if you lack clean cooking fuel, adequate water, sanitation, drinking water, um, electricity, housing, and assets. So this is the structure of the global MPI. And a person is identified as poor if they're deprived in at least one third of the dimensions or of the weighted indicators with the indicators weighted equally within their respective dimensions. So just a, a quick human story. Um, this is Natat Nahato from Uganda, three-year-old, a bundle of energy. Um, and she lives in a house that, according to the global MPI, has natural or rudimentary materials because it's beautiful, but when it rains, it, it can be difficult. They have electricity, and the electricity is from a solar lamp um, that also charges their cell phone. Um, the older brothers and sisters of Nahato have dropped out of school because they couldn't pay the, the school fees. Um, her mother um, has 10 children and she's 38 years old. Um, and so we learn a little bit about the daily routine of the family, um, where they spend their time. And her mother works in a movie, works a lot in the fields. Um, and then they come home to cook their evening meal. So we can think about the poverty indicators that this family would face. But of course, that isn't going to tell the whole story. For example, it doesn't say that Nahato, as you could see from her face or her siblings, that they were outgoing, that they were confident, that they laughed and had great relationships within the family. And at night, sometimes they have a, a radio they share between the neighbors and they dance. And so they have the enjoyment and so only looking at poverty diminishes a person and their vocation to human flourishing, their prayer, their love, their sadness and tragedy. That's not only captured in the dimensions that we measure. 
So you have to, again, be humble and realize the limits of the data that we use. But according to these data, Nahato and her family are deprived in one half, 50% of the weighted MPI indicators. And so she's poor because she's deprived in more than one third. And we could give other cases, for example, a muta in southern India, Tamil Nadu, is a 14-year-old girl um, in her school uniform. Um, and these are the, her deprivations obviously don't address include education, but they do include undernutrition and some living standard um, measures. And Amuta was very active about her status and actively contributed to a study on poverty, not only in her school, but also in her community. So she was very much an example of an activist, of a, of a, of a protagonist uh, working to address her situation. So that's a little bit the, the building blocks of a measure. And then very quickly, what we do is for each person, we have a matrix in the data set. We identify each person as deprived or not deprived in each indicator. We weight the indicators. We add it up to create a deprivation score, which is the percentage of dimensions in which you are deprived. Then we compare your score to the deprivation cutoff of one third, the poverty cutoff of one third. And if you're deprived in one third or more, you're poor. And then we do something very simple. We multiply the percentage of people who are poor because they're deprived in one third or more of the indicators in this example. In another measure, it might be 20% or 40%. And we multiply that by the average deprivation score among the poor. And that simple multiplication creates a measure that has strong axiomatic properties. You can publish it in books. You can do lots of tests um, to it. And so I won't go into those details, but to say that um, uh, we've tried to document them and show different ways that you can robustify your measure and, and analyze it uh, quantitatively. And that work that I have done on measurement has been with James Foster. James Foster in 1984 wrote the most highly cited economics paper. And he did it when he was in graduate school. Um, he also is a leader in his church um, and he comes to this work out of a, a much broader motivation uh, for the underlying circumstances in which people find themselves. Um, and that brings me to another aspect of working on poverty as an economist or a statistician or a policy person. We work on measurement, that's what we do. Um, but one of the advisors to our research center was the late and beloved Sir Tony Atkinson, who wrote on poverty and inequality throughout his career, beginning in 1969. And in his last book, which was published posthumously in 2019, he mentioned that there's something different when you study poverty. And it's that you can be interested in measurement, but you have to link work on measurement to action. Poverty statistics matter if they motivate people to act to redress human suffering. And so that, that approach to an academic subject, even if you do publish papers or do studies, that that's, I think, an important part. So very briefly, I'll just show you a couple of results and then we'll move to well-being and then close. So this is an example of a talk that you could give if you are doing some statistics and you could do it any year. All of these data are online. But you could say to your boss, to your government, to um, someone that you're trying to talk to about the importance of thinking about poverty. I'm going to present from the global MPI. And in 2020, it covered 107 countries and 5.9 billion people, over three quarters of the population of the earth. And what we found is that 1.3 billion, almost one in four people across those 5.9 billion people, 
almost one in four, 23%, were multidimensionally poor. Why? Because of those 10 indicators, they were deprived in at least one third. So now we're thinking about a population of 1.3 billion people, and one half of them have not celebrated their 18th birthday, their children. We have more poor children on this planet than we've ever had before. And then we might think, oh, but they live in low-income countries. Well, two-thirds of them live in middle-income countries, and primarily in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, primarily in rural areas. And when we say multidimensional, we mean multidimensional. Of those 1.3 billion people, 99% have at least three deprivations at the same time. And 83.5% have at least five of deprivations in those 10 indicators that they are carrying at the same time. And so this is the population that we are trying to think about, whose lives we're trying to bring to the attention of the wider world so that our economic systems, our environmental policies can protect, support, empower, and respect them. So um, another sad fact is that um, across 5 billion people um, in nearly a third of the 75 countries we covered, multidimensional poverty among children was slower than among adults. And so children are in some sense being left behind. And in the economy of Francesco, which is focusing on the youth, we really must, must think about that and how to focus on children among our work on poverty more generally. Um, another thing people would ask you is, excuse me, Diane, is monetary poverty the same as multidimensional? And you could say, no, actually, the black dots are monetary and the beige bars are multidimensional. And they're not, the headcount ratios of each are not the same. So we're measuring something different than money. So we have a second eye, we can see something that monetary poverty maybe doesn't show. And then Christian may say, well, how do you use this for policy? Well, the MPI mathematically is the weighted sum of the percentage of the population who are poor, and are deprived in each of the 10 indicators. So you can break it back down and see to what extent do I need to put children in school to reduce poverty in Madagascar? It's quite a bit. Um, to what extent is nutrition a problem here? How does that compare with my neighbor? You can see how people are poor by the indicators and how they cluster among different populations. And we did this nationally, but we do it subnationally as well. Um, and so, for example, these are some of the subnational regions of Africa, just so that we can see uh, by age, by rural, urban, by subnational regions, how poverty varies. And for each of these, we can see how people are poor. And that's what's online, in case you want to use it for your own analyses. A quick story to end the part on multidimensional poverty, and it's about Sierra Leone. So we covered poverty trends this year for 5 billion people in 75 countries. And 65 of those countries reduced MPI statistically significantly. But the fastest country to do so was Sierra Leone. And it did so between 2013 and 2017. Now, what's unusual about that time period? That is when Ebola struck Sierra Leone. So they were fighting a pandemic. And during that pandemic, they had a faster reduction of multidimensional poverty than any other country. Now, when pandemics strike, as we all know, there's lots of messiness. There's lots of mistakes. You have to respond faster than you know what to do. And so it's not perfect. And yet, fighting poverty doesn't require perfection. It requires effort. And it was good enough to reduce poverty. So our hope is that by providing some numbers, by providing some information, that imperfect situations can have a huge reduction in multidimensional poverty. So that's a lot, and I'm sorry to give you so much to digest. I don't want to give you indigestion, 
but I'm actually talking to you from Bhutan. The royal government of Bhutan has uh, measured not just GDP per capita, but gross national happiness. So I'd like to spend the last five minutes a little bit on how that is measured. And what you'll recognize is that since 20, 2008, they've used the same methodology as the MPI. So because there's interest in well-being, in integral human development, I thought it might be interesting, especially because the survey is about to field. And the people who are fielding the survey are young, many of them young unemployed volunteers. Um, and so there's a synergy between the work on gross national happiness now here and your work in the economy of Francesco. So gross national happiness quite an unusual phrase. In a sense, it came from the legal code of this country when it unified that happiness was one of the purposes of government. But really what it comes from is His Majesty the Fourth King of Bhutan, probably before he was 20 years old, said that gross national happiness in his view was more important than gross national product. And that idea has carried on in this country as being a pivotal articulation of the national objective, is expanding gross national happiness. But is that self-centered? If you look at the World Happiness Report, you see that the countries with the highest happiest, happiness are the richest. They're the ones destroying the planet. Happiness here is defined differently. It's defined as a balance. Um, with the environment, with culture, with economic, with social dimensions, where material and spiritual development occurs side by side. So it's not the Western me first happiness that doesn't take into account you in my community or you other sentient beings on this planet, but it's happiness because we are all in harmony and we are all moving towards flourishing. So there are nine domains of gross national happiness, which are measured. Three are familiar, health, education, and living standards. Three are common in the social science literature, governance, environment, and time use. And three are very, they resonate a lot with this economy of Francesco, community vitality, our relationships, our commonality, culture and resilience, legends, spirituality, and psychological well-being, which is prayer and meditation, positive and negative emotions, overall satisfaction with life. So gross national happiness means a balance between these, so that flourishing is multidimensional. And in terms of the measurement, there are between two and four indicators per domain and the domains are equally weighted. And the indicators show how people fare in these different domains. So just like for poverty measures, now we have a well-being vector. We have, for each of the 33 indicators, I'm either, I have sufficient to be happy, or I'm lacking for my integral human development. So each person can look at their own vector and see if it, coheres with their self-understanding. For example, this beautiful woman uh, has sufficiency in 84% of the domains of GNH. And then just like a poverty measure, you have a cutoff. And in Bhutan, if you have achievements in at least two thirds of the domains, then you are moderately or deeply happy by definition. So there's a cutoff, a happiness cutoff. But there's something different about happiness because how can you know how happy I am? How can a government make us happy? There's also interior work to be done in our souls. And so what governments can do is create the causes and the conditions of happiness. But the final step is up to us. And it happens deep in the recesses. And some people are completely fulfilled in abject poverty, like St. Francis. And some people are very well off and yet their soul is starving. That's beyond measurement. 
But in terms of measurements, we can say with this index in 2015 that 43.4% of Bhutanese enjoyed sufficiency and so we're happy by the GNH index. And there are different cutoffs to create a more sophisticated gradient. You can see how it varies, how men are happier than women. You can see how it varies geographically or by household size, by farmers or by monks. Monks are very happy. But this is my last point. You can also see how it changes. And this is what might be interesting for the School of Francesco and for our future well-being measures as a society. So between 2010 and 2015, there was a statistically significant increase in GNH. So the bars that go up are the indicators that went up. So living standards, recycling, um, access to government services, the number of days spent in cultural festivals on holidays, um, self, uh, the, the number of working days that you were not sick, even sleep went up, the number of hours of sleep. But what you see is that it didn't all go up. And that's what's interesting about having a view of integral human development. You can see social patterns and talk about them, pray about them, think about them. Look at psychological well-being on the far left. Life satisfaction went down a bit. Positive emotions went down quite a bit. Negative emotions went down even more. And self-reported spirituality went down the most. So that's a social change. So yes, there's growth in GNH overall. And yet some things are decreasing. And this is a change that we as measurement people can't prevent, we're, we're diagnosing it, we're saying this is what's happening. But we're also appealing to the wider society to have conversations, to think about where we are going, to think about how to nurture our relationships and our sense of belonging. So that's a little bit about metrics. It's about the importance of putting poor people as the protagonists, as the experts, and engaging with them. Um, and then it's about how you can do rigorous measures, knowing that they have to link to action, knowing that they're not enough, they don't tell the full story, and how this can be done for poverty as well as for well being. Measurement is not the answer, but it's one step along the process. And I do invite you um, to this work um, and to try and to, as part of the many activities that you'll do in this school and in harmony with the environment, to redress poverty in all its forms and dimensions. Thank you so very much. Thank you, Professor Alkair, for this inspiring talk. Thank you very much. I guess we can start with, um, with the discussion. And uh, we have Diane, and then Kathleen, and then Christian. You can uh, just uh, answer to each of the discussions. So I give the floor to Diane. Diane, the floor is, is yours. Okay, um, thank you, Professor uh, El Kayer. This is a very interesting topic. Um, uh, my name is Diane from Indonesia. I'm from Policy and Happiness Village, and I'm a public policy professional. And I graduated from the School of Public Policy, the London School of Economics and Political Science. And I attended your uh, lecture one year ago uh, at the philosophy of public policy course um, at LSE with, uh, uh, you were invited by Professor Alex Verhoeven and you were talking a lot about gross, na gross national happiness uh, of Bhutanese kingdom. And um, your concept of global multidimensional poverty index or MPI is very relevant for my country which is one of the largest decentralized countries in the world with highly diverse and dynamic socioeconomic and political context. I previously worked at the National Poverty Reduction Team of the Office of Indonesian Vice President, and my country adopt PMT or proxy means testing to create national social protection database, which helps the government at national and subnational sub levels in implementing targeting conditional cash transfer program. And this targeting social protection uh, 
has been very successful in reducing poverty because before COVID in this crisis and helping Indonesian government to spend, to spend state budget smarter and more accountable. So in this regard, I have two questions, if you don't mind. First, uh, I'm wondering in the aftermath of this extra, extraordinary pandemic crisis, which has changed the face of global poverty, um, will you ever modify uh, the MPI and add some corresponding indicators? For example, indicators concerning informality or gig employment, or indicators concerning uh, vaccine accessibility or indicators uh, like you mentioned before concerning uh, mental health treatment as subjective well-being. And my second question is that in your experience, how would you deal with imputation of missing values? For example, uh, in the case of my country, Indonesia, um, usually there is a lot of missing values of disabled member of household because of shame. So um, um, usually the, the head of the uh, household uh, uh, does not want to uh, inform uh, the statistician whether they have uh, disabled family members or not. So how, 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 how should uh, the policymakers deal with this? And I think that that is all my question and uh, thank you. Professor Arkay, if you want, you can answer. No, thank you so much, Diane, and please just call me Sabina. Um, yes, no, fantastic questions. And they are very much things that we would like to do. We would like to include in the MPI, informal employment, mental health, um, uh, empowerment, freedom from violence. Um, however, the surveys that we use usually do not have these indicators. So it really means that we need to ask those who are shaping the surveys to see whether it's possible for them to add some of these questions and take out some other questions. But you have to realize that they do a fantastic job in getting the data and it's not easy and it's hard to change the questionnaires. But that would be a hope is that there could be some information on informal employment uh, at least added if possible. And in terms of imputations, um, for the MPI, uh, you need to do multiple imputations because you have a vector of indicators and you're missing one. So, so far, we usually drop households that are missing an indicator if they're missing it for all household members. And we have a rule we follow if they're missing it for one or two. Um, but where there is, as you suggested, a, a systematic bias in the underlying data, that's something in a sense that the data provider needs to work on um, to try to fill it out before it comes to measurement side. Um, and so we can talk more offline about that, but um, at the moment we are trying to basically use the data sets that are high quality. And so we don't have to do imputations because we know that introduces error, particularly in a multidimensional environment. Thank you. Thank you. So Kathleen, it's your, your turn, please. Thanks. Thanks for your presentation, uh, Dr. Sabina Alquires. Thanks, uh, the Conan Francesco, for the opportunity and to represent my village, CO2 uh, so of inequalities. Uh, I would like to start with a phrase from Pope Francis in Laudato Si. Uh, the human costs are always economic costs, and economic dysfunction also involve human costs. An example of humanized economy is reflected by the MPI, a multidimensional index based on the capabilities approach of a Martisant, evaluating and making visible the vulnerability and inequality of people living in poverty. At the same time, different combination of deficits related with health, employment, education, or different aspects of their housing condition, social protection programs, or balance in their environment, according to the nation where they are. That is, people who carry different loads all the time than because of the pandemic 
has made these burdens even stronger and heavier around the world. The climate crisis and the health crisis have come together to show us the exacerbation of inequalities. Structural problems where states cannot find a compass to provide a global and collaborative response, that is, without leaving anyone behind. There is a reality. Economic development does not reach the poorest. Climate change, pandemic, and pollution, yes. In this sense, I have a question for Dr. Akiri. How can we measure the index of environmental deterioration and include it inside the MPI to reduce inequalities and achieve sustainable environmental justice for all? Thanks for your response. Thank you very much, Kathleen. Um, so uh, that's a very good question. And we obviously have tried to explore different options. And so we have some papers, some articles on it. But the basic idea is that if you think of poverty, you're taking a snapshot of the same person at the same time. And you're looking in different rooms of their lives at the deprivation, like undernourishment, lack of good housing, being out of school or without education or out of work or subject to violence. And so the appropriate environmental indicators to bring in, as you said, to the MPI are those that are also striking that same person at the same time. For example, maybe wild animals destroy my crops. It might be elephant or boar or deer. Maybe there's been a forest fire and I haven't recovered. Maybe there's a, flat, a, drud, a drought or a flood. And so these direct immediate impacts are part of the deprivations that I carry. Those kind of environmental experienced threats can be measured and brought in to the MPI. So the um, gross national happiness index includes what I mentioned, forest fire, flood, drought, wild animals eating the crop as experienced threats in its environmental dimension, for example. Another, the MPI of Dominican Republic says, is your house near a river that floods? That's a deprivation. But there are other deprivations like climate change, where the pace is different. It might not strike me now, but it makes the probability of future uh, problems much higher. And in those variables, you don't bring it into the MPI, but you overlay it on a map. So you can see how these different variables are, are working. And think of how to analyze them jointly. So there are different techniques that we can use, but the important thing is to bring the variables into conversation. And um, we are working on a paper in Madagascar. And I would ask your thoughts and prayers for that country, which is struck very, very strongly by the virus at the moment. Um, but it has the fastest loss of forest cover and it did not reduce its MPI over a 10 year period. And so, this nexus of environmental and human poverty is very strong. And trying to understand that in a positive way, understand that as a springboard of action that will change it um, is the task of these joined up analysis. So thank you so much for the question and for all of you on this call who are working and interested on the nexus of environment and poverty. Thank you, thank you all. And then Christian, is your thought, please. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Sabina, for your presentation. Also, thank you, everyone, for this opportunity. I'm Christian. I'm from Argentina, now living in Brazil. I'm an economist. After my graduation, I've been working on the creation and development of social projects, educational programs, and public policies. I'm also part of the Economic Communion Project, and I work in, on the Amartya Sen program at La Plata University. Today, I'd like to share with you two brief reflections and propose some questions. I think, Sabina, that the first, uh, maybe you have answered in your, during your presentation, but maybe it's an opportunity to, to go deeper. Uh, as we know, there is a need for a great, a paradigmatic and holistic change in the way we think economy. 
and moreover, in the structures that move the world's economy. The capability approach is a light that can guide us in this way, in this new way, both in an academic and in a social and economic policy sense, I think. During the economy of Francesco process, we have learned many things. One of the most important, I think, it is about how knowledge is built. It is not about objectivity, that of a non-existent pure science, not contaminated by scientists, or subjectivity based by the interest, ideology, and limitation of this. But is it about intersubjectivity, which focus us to consider the task of the scientists as a social product, inseparable from the rest of human culture, in dialogue with other scientists and with society as a whole. We have rediscovered as well the re that relational goods are the key goods for the new economy. Those goods, as Martha Nussbaum explains, in which the relationship by itself constitute the good. It means gratuity. And of course, they are not quantified by the market. At the same time, they are a key factor when talking about opportunities, especially opportunities for people living in poverty. If a social project or a public policy doesn't start by getting to know the people, by sharing time with them, their context, their histories, their culture, for sure it won't reach the effectiveness and the sustainability that it could. As Green and Hume 2005 warned, poverty is often conceptualized in such a way that it's not seen as a product of social relations. Poverty is always a local phenomenon, also global, but always local. When talking about global statistics, there is always the risk to committing a kind of culture side, I mean, to her culture. It is a big challenge because between statistics and reality, there is complexity. There are cultures, there are people living in different contexts with different historical dynamics. Thus, my first question is how to deal with this complexity? No, Shall I? Yeah, uh, briefly. No, I think that's a, a fantastic question. And I would say, yes, capability approach has recognized that since Aristotle, there's an architectonic role for philia, for friendship. But that was also in Thomas Aquinas um, that basically, and, and it's very useful when you think about multidimensional measurement and love, because you are my friend. And so I care about you. And I care about you in all dimensions of your being. But one of your dimensions of your being is your friendship with Dion. And you care about her in all dimensions of her being. And because I care about you, I therefore care about her in all dimensions of her being. And so in a sense, then you tiptoe out to having a universal understanding that to will the flourishing of all people in all dimensions of their being is you know one of the components of love and it's the friendship and the relationship between us that comes that way but then as you said the contexts and the personalities the individual vocations are very different and so how do we do this so i'm going to go back to mathematics and then to the substance of what you said mathematically what you'll notice is that you didn't have to have well-being in all dimensions to be happy by the GNH index, or you didn't have to have all of the poverty dimensions because there's room for, for individual preferences, for choices, for personalities. You don't have to be a Renaissance person. Um, and so mathematically by having a multidimensional measure that says you can have some deprivations, the world might consider deprivations, but they might be chosen for you. And that's one way of permitting this plurality and diversity. Um, going back to your question about how do you deal with the need both to have some comparability and, and to have the contextuality, there's no good answer, I don't think. But I think that the best it, that, that we keep doing is Amartya Sen has this wonderful phrase, um, which is also in the new natural law theory of John Finnis of things you value and have reason to value. So epistemologically, we might have some ideas, but also the question is, does the community value it? 
And if they detest broccoli and you say, but broccoli is good for you, the fact is they detest broccoli. And so you can't do a, a development program just about broccoli. Um, but on the other hand, um, there might be other kinds of, of knowledge that you have. And so that conversation, that engagement, recognizing the validity of the other as an actor, as a protagonist, but exchanging the information and the insights that you have, I think that's part of the process. Um, and so we can step forward. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Uh, I go on with the second. Yes, Vanilla? Well, we are close to the conclusion. So. Okay. Thank you to the discussant for this discussion and I, in the chat there are a lot of questions and also um, everybody is thanking Sabina Alkair for uh, the inspiring talk. So I thank Sabina from the chat and from all the participants to, the, to this class and I want just to um, bring one question from the chat. Uh, is the question from uh, Isabella Ch Sanchez. Um, and this is a question that is also interesting for me. So this is why I picked these uh, questions. <laughs> so uh, she's asking, uh, um, do you consider feasible to complement quantitative measurement with information from participatory methods? Because at the beginning, we start with uh, the World Bank, Bank participatory uh, assessment and also the story that you uh, told us were something from the field. So uh, do you consider feasible the combination of these two approach? Very much so. No, I, I find it very enriching to have both. Um, and there are different moments. For example, when you design a poverty measure, you might take it to the community and then say, what's poverty for you? You might have a survey and see who's poor by this test measure made in the capital city. And then you ask them and they tell you why you're wrong, who you said was poor that's not poor and who you didn't say was poor that is poor and why. And then you all of a sudden see how they see from a measurement perspective. So that's one moment to engage in the participatory work. But then there would be other moments um, when there's the design of programming or when it's time to make the next plan for the next phase. Um, when, again, now with the new technologies, we're able to do so much um, different kinds of engagements. But I think that, that that ongoing dialogue and conversation is essential because measurement is not static and policies need to be contextualized as Christian also brought out. So um, uh, I certainly am enriched by it. And I think it's also important to communicate metrics. If you don't have a face and a life like Nahato, so Nahato, she was visited by a student in the university whose beloved was working in that uh, region. And so they did the case study together. Um, she, was, she had been working with that um, uh, community for some time. And so that, um, yeah, having a little bit of a deeper understanding in, into a few people's lives, if they're willing to share with you and guide you and give you advice, um, then that brings it alive for many others. And so I think also bringing participatory work of communities, not just of individuals, and showing what the communities valued, how they articulated it, how they disagreed with the measurement response is a good thing. Thank you very much, Professor Alkai. Thank you, uh, guys, Thanks. from the, the floor. And uh, I give the floor to Paolo for uh, conclusion. And thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Thanks to you, Dalila. And thanks uh, really, mm -hmm. Professor uh, Alcairo, if I may, Sabina, as, as you tell us to, to call it. <laughs> that is, and also as Christian did very well, by the way. So this, no, really, thank you. Because this is, I think, is a, re a lesson that not only we value, but still we have reason to value, really. Because not only you put us, you tell us many interesting things and you brought a lot of topics, but also you address economy of Francesco. I noticed that many times you quoted economy of Francesco saying, you know, and, uh, and it's, very, it's very good for us. So, and, and also, I don't know, because now I have to do the announcements of the next webinar, but if you want to say some <laughs> last, uh, not last words, but some words of, of uh, goodbye to, to economy of Francesco, it would be very appreciated. Yes, no, I. I think that this is a, such an important initiative because I think it's, economics is poised to change and that in a decade it will be different. 
many of our assumptions of the old economics that I learned have been undone by modern psychology. The pandemic has done undone many of our priorities. Now we value exercise, mental health, community, spirituality in ways that maybe some people didn't before the pandemic. Hmm. And so it's a time of creative fervor, ferment. And I think that you, with a new fresh idea and with help, you know, enthusiasm could really seize a moment. And I mentioned that I'm writing from Bhutan, Bhutan, which has been closed to capitalism and is now thinking of how do you, how does it open wisely? And if your ideas were ready, you know, this would be an interesting context to study, to understand, to engage the people and see about implementing some, again, jointly conceived ideas. But I think the time is right. And so my prayers and my good wishes are with you. Um, I think you. it's it's hard work, but please, please keep going. <laughs> no, uh, we need you. Please keep going to, to be with us. I mean, to, to follow <laughs> us also a little Absolutely. bit. Absolutely. Also, we, we would like to invite you again for the next session of the school, also because Christian has to make another question. And so next year he will do that. <laughs> so thank you. No, thank you very much. Now it's, uh, uh, I want to end this, uh, this meeting uh, saying three things uh, on behalf of the organizing committee. So first of all, we apologize because we have had some uh, technical problems. So a lot of people uh, told us, I, I cannot use the, the link, I cannot go. And also, I'm, but I'm relieved because uh, with technical problems, we had like 300 people <laughs> following the lesson. So I mean, that is, I mean, it's very good uh, considering having problems. But next time, we will start uh, a little uh, before the, the the webinar, so that everyone can can join. Second of all, uh, the, I have to tell you the next two appointments of the school. So on the 21st of April, uh, we will have the workshop. So we had four lessons. Uh, Luigino Bruni, Pier Battista Pizzaballa, Julie Nelson, and Sabine Arcari. But now we are also interested in discussing the old food for thoughts they shared with us. So uh, we ha you have still 24 hours to register for this uh, uh, workshop. You have received an, an email. It's on April 21st. It will start at 3 p.m. Uh, Italian time, uh, UTC plus two. And, uh, and then uh, to conclude, uh, the next appointment of the school uh, is very connected to what Professor Arcai taught us today, because uh, we will have uh, Giacomo Todeschini, he's an Italian historian, and he will lecture us on uh, Franciscan poverty. So St. Francis' idea of poverty. It's also Professor Arcai, if you want to attend, you are <laughs> very welcome, because, uh, no, because he, he, will let, he wrote this beautiful book, uh, uh, Franciscan Wealth, from voluntary poverty of St. Francis to market society. And also in the economy of Francisco, we value very much the Franciscan economic teachings and the Franciscan economic, and also this choice of St. Francis, voluntary poverty that uh, frees others from not voluntary poverty. And this is for us is very important. And I conclude uh, uh, asking Lourdes, uh, now Lourdes, uh, she's the, manager she will send the the last the sigla the last uh, moment but uh, i want to conclude telling you what uh, a missionary from kenya told me today she she because i was saying you know talking about poverty is difficult is a very you know difficult topic she told me it is good that you talk about it it's not good if you stop there i mean and if you if this month in which we as economy francesco talk about poverty study we have to to, to do i think that we can come out of April different, you know, with much more consciousness and, and willing to, to, to do something to change what uh, is wrong, the manifested injustice, as Amartya Sen is, uh, says, uh, you know, of this world. So thank you very much to all, uh, and I see you on the 21st, and then 28th of April with Giacomo Todeschini. Bye. Goodbye. <laughs>